Good morning, brothers and sisters. Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 14, is one long sentence in the Greek, and it is one of the most power-packed prayers in all of Scripture. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, did not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Praying without ceasing is when prayer becomes as natural to us as our regular breathing. Unless we are sick or smothering, we rarely think about our breathing. We just do it. Likewise with prayer, it should be the natural habit of our lives, the atmosphere in which we constantly live. Paul desired to see believers filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The word filled carries the idea of being fully equipped. It was used to describe a ship that was ready for a voyage. The believer has in Christ all that he needs for the voyage of life. God is willing to reveal his will to us if we are willing to ascertain it. We dare not say to God, I would like a free 30-day trial of your will. If I like it, I will do it. We will never know the will of God in that case. We cannot dictate to God the terms on which we will condescend to do His will. God does not have to make a deal with us. He does not need us. We need Him. We do not bankrupt the will of God when we do not do the will of God. We bankrupt ourselves. We cannot blackmail God. Those who were troubling the Colossian saints boasted of their superior knowledge. These Gnostics had evolved a complex system of mystical and imaginative teaching regarding the soul's approach to God. Paul prays that all the saints might become possessors of this knowledge, indicating that it was open for all to appropriate, not a secret mystery into which only a favored few could be initiated. If the Gnostics had their superior knowledge, so did the Christian church. The former was speculative and false. The latter was positive and true. Paul prays that not only might they have it, but that they might be filled with it. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. The ultimate aim of right knowledge, epigenosis, is a right or righteous walk. Vance Havner adds, What you live is what you really believe. Everything else is so much religious talk. The believer who walks in a manner worthy, axios, of the calling with which he or she has been called, is one whose daily living corresponds to their high position as a child of God and fellow heir with Jesus Christ. His or her practical living matches their position, and it does this because they are walking in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. One of the tragic paradoxes in modern evangelical circles is the emphasis on spiritual knowledge and Christian service without connecting these matters to purity of personal character like holiness or godliness. God builds character before he calls to service. He must work in us before he can work through us. Knowledge 
conduct, service, and character must always go together. We know God's will that we might obey it, and in obeying it, we serve Him and grow in Christian character. While none of us is perfectly balanced in these four factors, we should strive for that balance. It goes on to say, Strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. The present tense indicates that believers are to be continuously strengthened. The passive voice indicating that the strengthening comes from without, from an outside source, meaning God. That power is available to the believer who is filled with the knowledge of God's word. God is not like a booster rocket, giving believers an initial boost of power and then leaving them to fly on their own. Spiritual growth and maturity can come only as we yield to God's word and permit him to do his work in and through us. Regarding patience, too many Christians have a tendency to quit when circumstances become difficult. The saintly Dr. Raymond Eadman, late president of Wheaton College, used to remind the students, quote, It is always too soon to quit. I have often thought of that statement when I find myself in the midst of trying circumstances. It is not talent or training that guarantees victory. It is perseverance. By perseverance, this snail reached the ark, said Charles Spurgeon. God's power is evidenced in our lives, not only in our patience and long-suffering, but also in our joyfulness. When circumstances are difficult, we should exhibit joyful patience. And when people are hard to live with, we should reveal joyful long-suffering. There is a kind of patience that endures but does not enjoy. Paul prayed that the Colossian Christians might experience joyful patience and long-suffering. So the question is, why should we live this way? Because Christ has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. The Greek word delivered is ruma, which means God drew or snatched us to Himself out of danger and away from the clutches of our mortal evil enemy, Satan and his minions, who rule in the domain of darkness. Rumai emphasizes the greatness of peril with which deliverance is given by a mighty, by a mighty act of power. Rumai was used to describe a soldier going to a wounded comrade on the battlefield and snatching him to safety. The great danger we were rescued from is that the wages of sin made us liable to eternal death and placed us in the kingdom of Satan and subject to his rule and authority in bondage to our old sin nature inherited from Adam. In conclusion, since we were bought with a price and we are not our own, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is our reasonable service. God desires us to walk in a manner worthy of Him, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of Him, strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. Maranatha.